For this lecture, we'll be discussing the use of multi-detector CT to image the airways, and we'll also be discussing virtual bronchoscopy. A more general term for using CT to evaluate the airways is to say CT bronchography. And what this is is computer-generated 3D images, which are post-processing technique, to produce high-resolution images of the trachea and the bronchi. And you can also produce endoluminal or endobronchial views. So these are the virtual bronchoscopy. So we use the term virtual bronchoscopy when we specifically mean like flying through the airway, like you fly through the colon on a virtual colonoscopy. You do the same thing with the airway. So CT bronchography is a general term saying using CT to look at the airway, and that usually is a combination of axial images, multiplanar reconstructions, maybe volume rendering, and the fly-through view, which is the virtual bronchoscopy. And the virtual bronchoscopy is what simulates the conventional bronchoscopy. So this idea of using CT to image the airway is not new. It was first described maybe 10 years ago or so, but it's now gaining new interest as a result of significant improvements in both the scanner technology and also the software. Because we had such improvements in the virtual colonoscopy software, we can apply those to doing CT airway imaging as well. So those significant improvements in the software have allowed us really to become more interested in using CT to look at the airways. The technique is first, <clears throat> IV contrast is not needed, not usually. Sometimes we will still give it. If the indication is involvement of the airway by tumor, we would want to give it, or if it's suspected that there may be vascular involvement. So sometimes the airway can be compressed by vessels, so you would definitely want to give it then. But for typical indications for CT bronchography or CT bronchoscopy, we would not give IV contrast. So that would be something like, is the stent patent. So they put airway stents in of the trachea or the bronchi in patients. So you want to say, is it patent or not? You don't need IV contrast for that. If you're looking for a foreign body aspiration, maybe in a child, um, CT is easy to do, and it will be able to detect some things that are not metal. If you're doing plain film, it can be very difficult to detect a Lego, for example, because that's plastic in the airway, but you'll be able to see it with CT. And if you're looking for airway stenosis, so evaluate, does this patient have a stenosis in the bronchi or in the trachea, then it would not be necessary to give IV contrast. So if you're going to do CT imaging of the airways, first you have to figure out what your indication is and then decide whether or not you want to give IV contrast. The scan protocol, this is where you want to use your good scanner. So 64 slices is what we have, 0.6 millimeter collimators, very thin, so that sub-millimeter collimation. That means that the data will be isotropic. It will maintain its high resolution in any plane, whether you're looking axial, coronal, or sagittal, or whether you're doing your fly-through images, you're going to have really high resolution images. Our typical KVP is, a, is 120, and if we were doing a diagnostic scan, we probably would use 200 effective MAS, so which is fairly high, or 160 with a rotation time of 0.5 seconds, or 0.3 seconds, depending on what kind of scanner you have. Now, reducing the radiation dose is possible because there's a, definitely a high natural contrast between the airways and soft tissue. The dose can be definitely reduced in children and adults when you only want dedicated airway imaging. If you're specifically looking at a vessel involvement or a sling, these congenital things, you may not want to decrease the radiation. But if it's just airway, you could definitely decrease it, and definitely you should consider that in children. So this is a study of 23 children with suspected foreign body aspiration. So they did the CT scan with a low MA, so 25 to 50. That's relatively low, even for children, but much more appropriate radiation dose for a child. And then they did the multi-detector CT, including the virtual bronchoscopy fly-through views, and the image quality was excellent in 40%, good in 52%, and poor in 9%. So overall, it was acceptable in the majority of the patients, even with the low-dose technique. If it's a very difficult case, I would not decrease the MA because you don't want to save radiation uh, at, the, at the expense of a non-diagnostic study. So if it's some difficult case or an uh, aspirated form body that may be plastic or something like that, you may not want to cut the MA as much because you want very high resolution to make the diagnosis. Otherwise, you've wasted the radiation that you've given. The scan itself only takes a few seconds, so it still can be done even in very small children and even in infants without sedation. The scan in a child, you know, a couple month old child will only be maybe five seconds. So most infants can sit still for five seconds. Now if the patient's crying, then every single scan will have motion during those five seconds. But most of the time we will not have to sedate children. You just have to keep them quiet for five seconds and the scan's over.
We usually will image the patient at inspiration, so we'll have them take a breath in and hold it. Obviously can't do that in young children or infants, so we just have them breathe normally. Sometimes you may specifically want to get inspiration and expiration. So patients with conditions like tracheobronchial malacia, that's kind of weakness or atrophy of the wall of the airway. It may help to get inspiration and expiration because in those patients during inspiration, the airway may look normal, but during expiration it may collapse. So you want to know what your indication is, whether or not you want to get inspiration and expiration. Sometimes with stent failure for an unknown reason, you may see that the stent's patent but it's not working properly. It may be the same thing. It may be collapsing during expiration. And some people think it may help for foreign body aspiration to do both. It may help sometimes with very tiny foreign bodies that are out in the periphery of the airway where you won't necessarily see the foreign body itself, but you'll see the secondary signs such as air trapping, meaning there's a portion of the lung that the air is not leaving during expiration. So you'll be able to detect that if you do also an expiratory scan. But most of the time, you're not going to be using IV contrast. Um, you're going to be using a reasonable MAS, maybe 120 to 160 and you'll be doing it during inspiration. But tailor the exam to the clinical indication and the person that you're scanning. So if it's a child, maybe foreign body, decrease the MAS. If it's a child, it's a vascular sling or some vascular abnormality, you would not decrease the MAS and you would give IV contrast. Now, typically for the 3D imaging portion of the exam, we are gonna make point 0.75 millimeter slices and reconstruct every 0.5 millimeters. That's going to give you the overlap and the resolution necessary to do a high quality 3D exam, whether it be multiplanar reconstructions or whether it be full volume rendering or the fly through. Now, I would also suggest that you create thicker slices, so three to five millimeter slices, and you can reconstruct them every three to five millimeters, and that's to look at all the other organs because you don't want to be looking at 0.5 millimeter slices when you're looking at the heart and the lungs and things like that. So you also may want to consider what algorithm you're using for your reconstruction. So it's often useful to reconstruct the data both with the high resolution edge enhancing kernel, so something like in our scanner would be a B80, or with a soft tissue kernel as well, so something like a 40. So do it at both your soft tissue algorithm and your edge enhancing. The soft tissue is helpful for all the mediastinal structures, but that edge enhancement is really good for the airways. Thin slices, what we do is send to the 3D workstation, and then we'll usually use a combination of multiplanar reconstructions, very easy, available on all workstations, axial, coronal, sagittal views, very easy to create, and high resolution in all three planes because you're using submillimeter collimation. So you can at least do that. If you have more sophisticated 3D imaging platforms, then you can do the full volume rendering, which gives you a nice look of the entire airway, the trachea and bronchi, and it can actually separate out um, all the airway from the rest of the lungs and just gives you very detailed imaging of the airway and the branches. Virtual bronchoscopy is when you do the fly-through, so you specifically need that software, the virtual colonoscopy software, where then you can have the camera fly through the airway like it flies through the colon. This is um, a recent article where they looked at the precision and accuracy of the radiologic findings, and they felt that it can be pr improved if the axial multiplanar reconstructions and endoluminal views are viewed simultaneously in a workstation. So that means instead of just doing one and then another, you're actually looking at them interactively. So it's very similar to how we review virtual colonoscopy. You want your multiplanar reconstructions to be available right there and your fly-through views at the same time so you can easily go back and forth. If you see something on the fly-through, you want to correlate it very quickly with the MPR images. So you want them all on the same workstation at the same time, easy going back and forth between the MPRs and the endoluminal views. When you're performing surface or volume rendering of the airway, you have to select the appropriate thresholds, and this will affect your imaging of the airways greatly. If you pick the wrong thresholds, you will artificially narrow the airway just by the settings that you choose. So you may want to consider having separate specific protocols when you're imaging the airway so that you know that the thresholds are correct. So from the literature, what they suggest is you probably want um, a negative 400 to a negative 600 when you're visualizing the central bronchi, so like the trachea and the main stem bronchi. When you're going out to the distal airways, it's better to have a negative 750. So it's not necessarily going to be the same threshold setting whether you're looking centrally or peripherally. So we're going to start with the trachea and review anatomy a little bit. The trachea is usually between 9 and 15 centimeters long in an adult. 
it varies by the size of the patient, basically. It usually begins around the C6 level, which is the um, cervical vertebral body, 6 level, at the inferior border of the cricocartilage. Diameter in adults is usually between 2 and 2.5 two and centimeters, and it's divided really into two sections. You have the cervical portion, that's above the thoracic inlet, and then the interthoracic portion, which is below the thoracic inlet, to the bifurcation, which is called the carina. Anteriorly, the trachea is supported by 16 to 20 C-shaped rings of cartilage. So these are little cartilaginous rings that are seen anterior to the trachea, and these support the trachea. The posterior part of the trachea is more of a membrane, and that's the pars membranacea is how they say it. This membrane is flexible, and that will actually change during inspiration and expiration. And if you force expiration or cough very quickly <coughs> like that, it will actually bulge. So when you're looking at the trachea, you're looking for these cartilaginous rings, and then you'll see that membrane posteriorly. As the trachea goes inferiorly, you'll see it will branch, and that is the carina. And that's usually at the T4 to T5 level. The trachea divides into the carina. The ridge formed by the downward and backward projection of the last tracheal ring. So that's what causes the carina. And then you divide into the right and the left main stem bronchi. The main stem bronchi pass inferiorly and laterally from the carina into the lungs, and they're supported by cartilaginous rings as well. Both main stem bronchi are accompanied by pulmonary arteries. So usually the pulmonary arteries and the bronchi run together as a pair. The right main stem bronchus tends to be wider and shorter and in line with the trachea than the left main stem bronchus. And that's why usually when a patient aspirates a foreign body, it goes down the right main stem bronchi. And then the right will divide into three secondary lobular bronchi. There's a right upper lobe, a right middle lobe, and a right lower lobe. Now, each of these have subsegmental branches, and I've listed them there. In reality, I usually don't kill myself trying to figure out which branch is rich, but it's important to know it's in the right main stem bronchi, it's an upper lobe bronchus, a right middle lobe bronchus, or a right lower lobe bronchus. But you can, with CT, get out that bar so you can actually see those subsegmental branches of the bronchus. The left is usually more angulated and longer than the right, so aspiration of foreign bodies usually goes down the right, not the left, because of that orientation. And often pulsations from the heart can be appreciated along that bronchus. So during a conventional bronchoscopy, when the endoscopists are in there, sometimes they can see pulsations on the left main stem bronchus because of the heart. The left main stem bronchus only branches twice. So it goes into the left upper lobe and then the left lower lobe. Now once it gets to the left upper lobe, we have a left upper lobe branch and then a lingular branch. So there's two branches of that and then the left lower lobe. And I've listed all the subsegmental branches for you as well. And you can follow those out on CT, but typically you don't need to get to that type of detail. Applications. So there are a variety of reasons you may want to do CT scans. You may want to detect anatomic variants. Typically we would see this for tracheobronchial stenosis, so they're worried about stenosis of the airway cancers involving the airway, endoluminal lesions, image guidance, fistula, so fistula from the tracheus, trachea to the esophagus, for example, or stent planning and follow-up. So you may want to uh, get a view of the trachea before a stent to be able to see the size, and then afterward to make sure that it's appropriately located, and then in trauma patients. So let's talk first about anatomic variants. There's something called a tracheal diverticulum, and this is an outpouching of the tracheal wall. It can be single or multiple. It's noted at autopsy in about 1% of patients, so people probably have it and have no symptoms. But some people, the, the diverticula can be large and can trap secretions and become infected, so they become symptomatic. And they will present with something like a cough or repeated infections, repeated bronchitis. Now, congenital tracheal diverticulum are the most common ones that we see, and basically this is just a little extra bud that was always there on the trachea. It was an abnormal aborted bifurcation of the trachea or the other um, bronchi, and it's usually four to five centimeters below the true vocal cord, so it's in the trachea itself, just above the carina. It's almost always on the right, and these are true diverticular, which means they have all the wall, all the layers of the wall. But you can also see acquired tracheal diverticulum. And this is usually the results of increased intraluminal pressure. So somebody with a chronic cough, chronic emphysema, they can just have so much pressure in their airway that, that they can pooch out these little diverticula. This can occur anywhere along the trachea. And they usually have a wider mouth. And they don't have all layers of the wall. So that, that's how you know it's acquired versus congenital. 
it doesn't really matter to us. They're going to look the same, except the congenital are usually on the right, and the acquired can be anywhere. So what do they look like? So here's an example. You see the trachea here. And then you see this extra little bubble of air here, and that's a little diverticulum. Here's the coronal view. You can see the trachea coming down, right main stem bronchus, left main stem bronchus. And here's the small diverticulum right there. This is a volume rendered view in which I've made the airway transparent, so it almost looks um, like an edge enhanced or like a double contrast barium enema effect. And you can see here's the left main stem bronchus, here's the right main stem bronchus, and here's the small right diverticulum. So to review the anatomy, the trachea, left main stem bronchus, you see how that's angled a little bit more than the right main stem bronchus, and that's why aspirated foreign bodies will typically go down the right. Then when you get to the left, you're going to have a left upper lobe, which branches left upper lobe and lingula, and a left lower lobe branch. The right is going to have a right upper lobe, and a small bronchus intermedius to the right middle lobe, and the right lower lobe. Here I've made the airway look white, and you can see here's the trachea, right main stem bronchus, left main stem bronchus, and there's the small diverticulum right there. Now there's another variant called a tracheal bronchus, and what this is is an aberrant bronchus, which formed is the in utero, and it usually occurs around the right side of the trachea above the carina, and it supplies the right upper lobe. So it's just an aberrant bronchus that goes to the right upper lobe. It's usually an incidental finding, and patients will not be symptomatic, but occasionally secretions can stick around there and cause an infection. It's been described with increased incidence in patients with Down syndrome and in patients with tracheal stenosis. If a patient has recurrent infections, then they may want to resect this aberrant bronchus with the associated lobe. Because if we take the bronchus, you have to take the lobe that it supplies. So here's an example. Here's the left main stem bronchus, the right main stem bronchus. This is a child, and look, at there's an extra branch here. That's a bronchus going to the right upper lobe, so that's a tracheal bronchus. Here it is showing in volume rendering with different opacities. Here's the trachea coming down. Now, usually the trachea would go into the right main stem, left main stem, and then the right would have three branches. But in this case, you have the aberrant branch to the right upper lobe, or tracheal bronchus. Now we're going to talk a little bit about stenosis. Now, virtual bronchoscopy is used increasingly to detect and to grade both benign and malignant airway stenoses. Virtual bronchoscopy has been shown to be accurate in assessing the stenosis. So it's accurate in measuring the width and the length of the airway stenosis. Now, keeping in mind that you have to use the correct thresholds that I've already discussed, otherwise you artificially make it look more narrow than it is. This was confirmed by an investigator, Burke, who did a correlation of stenosis shape and contour of virtual bronchoscopy with conventional bronchoscopy, and he ha had excellent correlation between the two. When the stenosis to lumen ratios were compared, virtual bronchoscopy and conventional bronchoscopy were found to be within 10%. So that's an insignificant difference. So that CT is excellent to measure the width and the length of a stenosis. This is an article by a different investigator, Hope, and he took 200 bronchial segments in 20 patients, and he had four slice multi-detector CT with two millimeter collimation. And these investigators found that CT was highly accurate in revealing the airway stenosis. It was 98% for virtual bronchoscopy. If you just use the axial images, actually it was excellent, 96%. If you're using coronal or sagittal, again, you're in the high 90s. But the virtual bronchoscopy just added a little bit more in revealing the presence of a stenosis. Virtual bronchoscopy also correlated highly with the flexible bronchoscopy for grading the stenosis. So it was very good, like the other investigator noted, um, for grading how severe the stenosis is. Virtual bronchoscopy images were better than other CT display methods for semi-quantitative assessment of the stenosis. So the, they felt the virtual bronchoscopy was better when you're doing your measurements. Virtual bronchoscopy can be especially valuable to evaluate children with suspected stenosis, either of the trachea or the bronchi. It's less invasive and safer than putting a tube down during a conventional bronchoscopy. And it also has the advantage of looking at the adjacent structures. So especially in children where you may be worried about a congenital abnormality, it's helpful to do the CT. Even if you go on to do a regular bronchoscopy, the CT will at least give you an idea. Is there a vascular ring? Is there another cause of this patient's airway problems?
This is an article with 12 children who had striders, that's difficulty breathing and obstruction in the airway and stenosis that were detected on conventional bronchoscopy, but they also scanned the patient using 16 slice MDCT and virtual bronchoscopy. And they found the CT found the stenosis in 11 of 12 patients. And in six patients, it was vascular compression. It was a double aortic arch in two, an aberrant right subclavian artery in one, vascular compression of the left main stem in two. In the one child which, in which they did not find the stenosis on the CT but was seen at virtual bronchoscopy, no surgery was performed. And the CT did not show any vessels causing the pulsations that they saw at, co at the regular bronchoscopy. So it's, it was kind of a questionable diagnosis made on bronchoscopy and the patient did not require surgery. Now, if, when you're looking for stenosis, there are some limitations of doing virtual bronchoscopy. First, sometimes there can be mucus in there or blood. So you can get false positives. You'll think that the airway is more narrow than it is, especially when you do the fly-through views, if there's blood or mucus there. Now, you, most people would not just do the fly-through views. So if you look at the axial and multiplanar reconstructions, you should get that sense whether there's mucus or whether there's blood there so you don't make that mistake. Also, virtual bronchoscopy, you cannot see the mucosa. Remember, this is not direct imaging of the airway. This is a surface rendering of the airway. So you're not going to be able to see the mucosa. So that's going to be some limitation. The diameter of the airway and CT is dependent on the respiratory cycle. Remember, you need to have the patient hold their breath or stop breathing. And some dynamic airway lesions that can cause problems with um, especially in children and sometimes adults, something like a problem with the vocal cords, you're not going to be able to see that on a CT, but you could see it at a bronchoscopy. So let's look for a couple of cases. 75-year-old man, he had a history of chondrosarcoma, which is a malignancy diagnosed in 1991, and then he presented with hemoptysis. In this case, you can see that this is the axial image, left main stem bronchus, right main stem bronchus, and you can see this thickening all along the right main stem bronchus. Here in the coronal view, you see this, all this abnormal tissue. So this patient actually had metastasis to the mediastinum and to the airway from his chondrosarcoma. When we look on the volume rendering images of the airway, here's the trachea, left main stem bronchus, right main stem bronchus, right upper lobe branch, which we discussed, bronchus intermedius, right middle lobe branch, right lower lobe branch. You can see that there's definitely narrowing here compared to the other side. Next patient was a 77-year-old female who had a history of Wegener's granulomatosis, which is kind of an inflammatory granulomatous disease that affects the lungs, and the patient had cough and fever. When we did our CT scan, you can see the right main stem bronchus looks good, but look at this narrowing and thickening of the left main stem bronchus. So that's definitely abnormal, and here you can see on the lung windows there. Next patient is a four-and-a-half-year-old male who had aortopexy, which means he had surgery to reposition the aorta because the aorta was compressing his left main stem bronchus, so that's a congenital abnormality. But even after the surgery, the patient had persistent coughing. And here you can see, here's the left main stem bronchus and the right main stem bronchus. Look here how the left main stem bronchus is being squeezed between the, this is the left atrium uh, pulmonary, art, uh, pulmonary vein here and then the pulmonary artery in the aorta there. So it was compressing it. So here you can see in our volume rendered image, you can see that it's coming down where the right main stem bronchus is here, left main stem bronchus, and you can see this focal area of narrowing. This is a volume rendered image from above and look at that narrowing right there. So it's kind of a dramatic. So even though they did the surgery, there was still some compression of the airway there that could account for his symptoms. When you look at the fly-through views, this is the trachea. We're in the trachea looking down at the bronchi. This is the right main stem bronchi because I'm at the patient's head. This is the left. And when you look at the left, you can see how narrow that opening is compared to the right. Okay, other indications for doing virtual bronchoscopy and CT airway imaging would be patients with lung cancer. So CT is really currently the primary imaging modality to detect, stage, and follow up primary lung malignancies. And the radiologists usually rely solely on the axial images when they're evaluating these patients. But investigators have begun to study the potential use of CT bronchography, or specifically virtual bronchoscopy, for this clinical application. Here's an article by Finkelstein, 32 consecutive patients with malignant thoracic tumors and suspected tracheobronchial lesions. So they had suspected involvement of their airway. They did virtual bronchoscopy and compared with conventional bronchoscopy and they were comparable in 20 of the 32 patients. 
The virtual bronchoscopy detected 13 of 13, so all of the obstructed lesions, five out of the six endobronchial lesions, but none of the mucosal lesions. So that's not surprising. If it's just affecting the mucosa, you're not going to be able to see it because you can't see the mucosa. The sensitivity for virtual bronchoscopy for abnormalities was 82% with a specificity of 100%, so excellent specificity. And uh, in that article, CT and virtual bronchoscopy had a sensitivity of 100% for obstructive lesions, 16% for mucosal lesions, and 90% for endoluminal lesions. So the overall sensitivity was 83% in patients with malignancy. Now, an advantage of doing virtual bronchoscopy over fiber optic, fiber optic or conventional bronchoscopy is the ability to image beyond the site of obstruction. So you're not limited. If, something, if a patient has an obstruction, the scope can't get past it, but you can still see past it on the CT. So in that uh, study by Finkelstein, virtual bronchoscopy was able to identify peripheral obstructive lesions in five patients, which were beyond where the scope could go. So that's good to keep in mind. Now, if we specifically look at endoluminal lesions, a virtual bronchoscopy can create both a global view of the airways as well as the endoluminal images, so it may basically fly through to find them. The literature varies on its usefulness and its indication. This was a relatively large study of 163 patients, 63 had endobronchial lesions, and the sensitivity and specificity of the CT bronchoscopy was 68% and 90% respectively. That study they used 3 millimeter slices and reconstructed every 1.5, so today we use thinner slices. And, um, they found only 16 of 24 lobar lesions and 11 of 34 segmental lesions. So as you get out farther and farther, it becomes more difficult for regular bronchoscopy and for CT to find tumors way out in the periphery of the airways. Um, another article by Finkelstein, 1.25 millimeter slices, and they detected five of six endoluminal lesions. So it's very likely that the thinner collimation available today will improve our detection of endoluminal lesions out further. It's unlikely that CT will completely re replace conventional colonoscopy for this indication because if you're really suspecting a malignancy and you don't find anything on a, on a standard CT scan and you're really worried that it could be involving the airway itself, you're probably going to need to do a bronchoscopy anyway to directly visualize the mucosa to detect the flat lesions and to do a biopsy. So here's some examples. This is a patient with papillomatosis. And here on the axial image is a small polyp or papilloma right at the carina. You know, you can see it there, but it's re relatively subtle there because of the carina and the branching. But when you look at it in the volume rendering, here's the trachea and the bronchi branching. Here you can see it right here at the carina. And here's the endoluminal view. So you can see it sitting right there as you branch into the right and left main stem bronchus. This is a patient with the indication of a tracheal mass, and here you can see on the axial images a big mass here in the neck involving the trachea. It's probably a little easier to see here on the sagittal images. Here's the trachea, and here you can see this mass kind of pushing into the lumen of the trachea. On the endoluminal view, it's very, very obvious. You can see this big tumor that's extended into the trachea itself. When we look at form body aspiration as an indication, it's um, a very common and serious cause of respiratory difficulties in young children. In many cases, foreign body aspiration may not be recognized initially, or the child may be treated for asthma or bronchiolitis. And in a study by Applegate, they showed that the diagnosis of foreign body aspiration was only made in 60% of cases within the first 24 hours. So it may be a late diagnosis when somebody thinks maybe the kid aspirated something. But prompt recognition of foreign body aspiration is actually essential. Delaying the diagnosis may lead to wheezing, infection, or serious airway obstruction. In suspected cases of foreign body aspiration, plain films are usually obtained and can be helpful, especially if it's a metallic foreign body. If the kid aspirates a coin, for example, you can easily see it on a plain film. But for plastic things and smaller items, it may be difficult to see on a plain film. So plain films may be normal in up to 30% of patients, and it's estimated that only 10% of aspirated foreign bodies are radio-opaque, meaning you could see them on a plain film. So CT is really the way to go, especially if you think it might be something plastic. Applegate used low-dose CT to visualize plastic toys in the airway of cadavers. And the sensitivity and specificity was 89%. So these are cadavers in which they put these little plastic, I think it was Legos, and they tried to see if they could find them. In uh, another article, they used low-dose CT, virtual bronchoscopy, and conventional bronchoscopy, and they were compared in 23 children with suspected foreign body aspiration. 15 patients, the CT and the bronchoscopy identified the foreign body. 
CT also had the advantage of showing secondary signs such as hyperaeration, meaning trapping of air in the lung, atelectasis, or infiltrate. So secondary signs, there may be an aspiration. 21 consecutive patients with suspected foreign body aspiration um, in this other study, but they said no value added benefit of doing the virtual bronchoscopy portion over the standard axial images and MPRs. So when you're looking for foreign bodies, clearly if you do a high resolution MPRs, in this study they showed that you were just as good as if you were doing the fly-through views. Virtual bronchoscopy can also be used for image guidance, that meaning help to direct biopsy or aspiration done by the bronchoscopist of the nodes and any masses that are seen. The success rate for regular transbronchial biopsies is only 50% for nodes and tumors that the bronchoscopist cannot see. So sometimes they can't really see it and they do these blind biopsies but then they don't get good results. But if you take your virtual bronchoscopy and you kind of correlate it and use it when you're doing your bronchial needle aspiration, it will definitely improve your success rate. So in the study by McAdams, they had great success using virtual bronchoscopy as a guide for transbronchial needle biopsy during the bronchoscopy. And it increased the sensitivity on a per node basis to 88%, which is much higher than doing the blind biopsies. McAdams attributed their success to their ability to correlate the node location and the angle of the needle approach using the virtual bronchoscopy instead of standard axial images alone. And they felt that the virtual bronchoscopy imaging gave them greater confidence to biopsy smaller lesions. So smaller nodes that they may thought were risky if they didn't have the imaging guidance, when they had that virtual bronchoscopy guidance, they felt comfortable in biopsying those lesions. And overall, it decreased the procedure time. So that was good. It took less time. Um, in order to biopsy the lesions. Stents is a very good indication for doing CT bronchoscopy. Both CT and virtual bronchoscopy can help plan for the stent placement and to follow up after stent placement to confirm patency, diagnose stenosis, detect migration of the stent, etc. In this study, uh, the authors demonstrated the usefulness of CT and virtual bronchoscopy as a method to evaluate the stents. And they compared CT and virtual bronchoscopy to fiber optic bronchoscopy and said CT demonstrated all but two significant abnormalities. And the two that were missed were related to granul granulomata formation at the origin of the stent. So the very edge of the stent they had trouble seeing. Tracheoesophageal fistula, also potential indication for doing virtual bronchoscopy. Patients who have esophageal atresia, for example, can have abnormal communication between the trachea and the esophagus. And you can see this on CT by demonstrating the communication uh, between the esophagus and the trachea. And so usually a CT would be the indication for that. Now current utilization, how do we use this today? We use it for stent planning and follow-up at our institution. So if they're planning to put a stent in the trachea or in the uh, bronchus, we will be using it for that. To evaluate suspected airway stenosis, we would be using it for that. Strider, something like that, they may want to order it for that. Foreign body aspiration, very good. Start with plain film, then use CT. Anatopic variants, and also when we're helping guide. And I just have a couple more cases I want to show you here. Here you can see lung cancer with a tumor involving the right main stem bronchus. This is the trachea, right main stem bronchus, and there's tumor encasing it. Here's the left main stem bronchus here, and this is the fly-through view. You can see how narrow that bronchus is because of the tumor kind of growing in there. Here's another patient with extensive lung cancer involving questionable involvement of the airway. On the corona, you can see the tumor extension in the fissures here and along the left main pulmonary artery. And here on the volume rendered view, you can see that there's also an abnormality here on the airway, which correlates to here. So there's actually tumor involving the trachea itself, extending into the trachea, narrowing the trachea. And this is what it looks like on the fly-through view there as well. CT is really good for congenital abnormalities. This is a patient with a hypoplastic lung, and you can see the left hemithorax is shrunken. There's really only a tiny bit of aerated lung here. And on the um, volume rendered transparency view, you can see a normal right lung, and this is the tiny little left lung there, almost no aeration. If you do the fly-through view, you can see you're coming down the trachea, you get a normal bronchus on the right. Remember we're looking from above, so this is the right. And then the left just narrows into a tiny pinhole. And here you can see on the opaque view you have a normal right and this is this tiny, tiny left.
This is a patient with Strider, and you can see a lot of tumor involvement of the trachea and the carina, and this is a significant narrowing. And you can see here as well, you can see that this tumor is narrowing the trachea significantly so that the patient is having Strider or difficulty breathing. Typically, they can inhale, but they have difficulty exhaling, and that can be um, a difficult problem. So in conclusion, I think I, I hope I've shown you how you can use virtual bronchoscopy in your daily practice to image patients with suspected airway lesions, especially form body aspiration or suspected congenital abnormalities in which the um, airway is narrowed or which you're suspecting a stenosis. Also in patients with lung cancer can be helpful to detect airway involvement. Thank you.